We're going to hear about uh, two great new books that share the central theme of military aviation, An Enduring Courage, Ace, uh, An Enduring Courage, Ace Pilot Eddie Rickenbacker and the Dawn of the Age of Speed. Award-winning author John Ross tells the story of the renowned World War I flying ace from his tough childhood in Columbus, Ohio. His education is a brilliant, instinctual mechanic and uh, going on to become a trailblazing race car driver. Ross shows how Rickenbacker had to overcome class prejudice to even be allowed to fly, and how once he did, exemplified magnificent courage and leadership. In Vanished, the 60-year search for the missing men of World War II, New York Times Magazine writer Will Hilton tells the story of the scientists, archaeologists, divers, and survivors' uh, families determined to, uh, to solve the mystery of what happened to a B-24 bomber and her crew that was shot down over the Pacific Islands of Palau in 1944. Hilton tells the story of the crew and their families and the determination of one man who refused to let go of the mystery uh, to bring closure to the families of the lost airmen. So it's a pleasure I get to introduce John Ross and Will Hilton. I uh, thought we'd begin by talking about one of the things that, that these, uh, both of these books share, and that is um, people flying in wartime. And uh, John, I wonder if you could go first and tell uh, a little bit about what it was like to fly in a World War I uh, airplane. Well, thanks, Mark, uh, for that introduction, and good morning, everybody. Um, one of the things which uh, was really interesting writing about this book was really trying to recreate what it was like to get into a World War I biplane at the beginning of World War I. And, you know, we were just, da you know, just downhill, just, you know, moments, it seems, from Kitty Hawk. So these airplanes, they call them... Um, chicken coops at first because you could stick a chicken in the seat. There were so many wires that the chicken had a hard time getting out of chicken coop. These were rudimentary planes, <clears throat> to say the least, biplanes. They didn't weigh very much. When these guys, Eddie Rickenbacker and these young men with the U.S. Uh, nascent Air Force, the Army at the time, went up, they went quickly above 10,000 feet, which is the uh, today, the FAA doesn't let you fly above 10,000 feet without supplemental oxygen because you start getting a little loopy at that point. These guys would just take it right up to 17, 18,000, and a little later, 20,000 feet. It also got extremely, extremely cold. These were open cockpits. They wore teddy bear suits, thick, thick teddy bear suits, but still, at the end of the day, they often had to manually, they had to peel their fingers off the joystick. It was so cold. You also got to remember that these early planes, the early Newports they were flying, were spitting off their oil lubricant, which was castor oil, if you can imagine. A gallon of it to two gallons per hour was exuded by the, by the whirling uh, gnome rotary plane, most of it back in their face. So those wonderful scarves that made them look so dashing, well, they were wiping their goggles off. They were inhaling that stuff, which made their insides go nuts. So they would often take little vials of blackberry brandy up to kind of settle their stomach. Now, okay, right, th th these are just some of the problems. They also didn't wear parachutes because the higher-ups, the powers that be, felt that parachutes, which were invented, would be defeatist. And that at the first hint of any problem, they'd jump out of the airplane. So I'm sorry, no airplanes. This ticked off Eddie Rickenbacker, something terrible. You also have to realize, too, that in the history of warfare, they were into something very new that nobody had ever really come across. A, that they were flying what, in essence, was a pyre, right? This was, they were, the, the inside of the airplane was all wood. It was had canvas and then a heavy shellacking. It was entirely just you know, a, a, a single spark could set that baby aflame. And if you imagine you're three, or three miles, you know, up, and your airplane catches fire, either through a spark from your engine or from an incendiary bullet from someone who's trying to shoot you down, and your plane is on fire, and the wind is just throwing it in minutes, they could be up there sitting on a platform that is all ash, and burning, you know, just burning terribly. So these poor young guys talked among themselves, and I found these great letters and references to this. What, what, what would they do if this happened? If they got up, would they jump? Would they take matters into their own hands and just jump? 
Or would they try to write it down, put the fire out, burn to death in agonizing, agonizing terror? Or the third option was a lot of them took their service revolvers up and uh, had a third option. So anyway, the courage that these guys had when they went up with this rudimentary technology is really something to behold. Well, I wish I could say that in the 30 years uh, after World War I, a lot of those problems that John mentions had been resolved by the time the guys I'm writing about get onto their B-24. But unfortunately, the, the B-24 Liberator uh, m retained a lot of those issues. Uh, it was not made of wood, but it was known to catch on fire very easily at the first uh, incoming round. The wings had a tendency to fold right up and then off the plane, which made it uh, awfully difficult to fly. The, uh, the guys getting on board had a little more protection from the wind, but um, the cracks and gaps whistled uh, with cold air coming through. They dehydrated very quickly, uh, and the, the uh, cabin was not yet pressurized, so there was this same issue of low oxygen content uh, as they flew. And on the, the B-24 was the, it remains the most produced multi-engine aircraft in history. Um, so over the course of just three or four years of heavy use in, in World War II, um, th thousands and thousands and thousands of these planes were taking off, and, and these guys were getting on board these long flights. Uh, the plane was designed specifically to cross um, extraordinary distances. Sometimes they'd go over a thousand miles one way to get to their target. Um, so they're spending hours and hours and hours in these conditions, and by the time they arrived above the enemy site, um, to, to, to make contact and hopefully take out some of the infrastructure with their, with their bomb load, um, they were pretty tired and they were pretty beat up. And so what you find among these guys is this sense of, uh, this sense of family forms on these crews. They stay together for long periods of time, not only in the air, but over the course of months they fly with the same crew again and again and again. And when I began working on this book, I really thought of it as a story about a different kind of family, the families who are left behind when one of these planes goes missing and nobody knows what happened to it. Um, there are 73,000 MIAs still missing from World War II, and uh, more than half of them vanished over the Pacific. And a lot of times it was on these planes that went down over water and nobody quite knew where. Um, but I also found, as I reported on, on the men who were on those planes, that there was another kind of family that formed for them uh, in the air and on the ground in these often very shabby uh, camps that were set up during the island hopping campaign. Um, they had to sort of crouch together under, uh, under the, the starry night and find a way to boost their own morale again before the morning mission. Um, so I think there's a tremendous amount of courage uh, that these guys uh, exhibited and, and, and also, in a way, learned. I mean, they had to sort of find a way to bring forth their courage um, in an environment that nobody had ever quite experienced before. We think about landings by the heroic Marines on, on some of these islands, uh, which, which maybe have something in common with the landing at Normandy, you know, coming onto these beaches to, uh, from amphibious vehicles and, having to, and knowing that there's going to be intense incoming fire and having to sort of surge forward and, and hope that you and your buddies can can, can be among the few who survive. The, the experience of these airmen um, often starting their day way, way, way uh, into the rear of the formation, uh, into, into the, in the sort of safe part of, of allied territory, but then having to cross again and again and again, day after day after day into the, into the uh, shells, the explosive ordnance that's coming down on them, uh, you know, and then returning back and having to sort of hit reset somehow uh, in their in their campsite, having to you know prepare themselves psychologically for that reversal, uh, you know, for months on end, I think is a is a different kind of courage in a sense, and one that we maybe haven't spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, but I, but I, I hope that we can, you know, in in the future we we can continue what we've seen in the last few years, which is a, a greater attention both on the air war. Uh, in World War II and on the Pacific uh, theater. It's a fascinating, fascinating place with a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of differences from, from what we think of as, as, as World War II because we so often think about the European front. That's a good segue. Um, 
I wanted to explore the notions of courage and, and, and the displays of determination. 